Sorry, Bibi, your mic is off. Uh, welcome everyone uh, to the third day of our Blockchain Community Day event at EPAM Technologies. My name is Vibhan Bopan and I'm a product manager at EPAM. Uh, today we have a very interesting topic uh, uh, to present to you. Um, let me give an introduction. Much media attention has been devoted to NFT uses for digital artwork and collectibles. NFTs that represent real world assets have received less focus. Yet they have the potential to open up whole new models of owning and trading assets. As the world is moving towards becoming more digital, NFTs offer everyone a strong solution for tokenizing property and ownership. This concept allows the real world asset to become digitized and stored, keeping in mind the security, legality, and storage of the asset. Today we have Kevin Lechidity, co-founder, CTO, and CPO of Fortress Blockchain Technologies, which specializes in providing key infrastructure for NFT and crypto innovators to onboard the next billion people onto blockchain. Kevin will be presenting his perspective on the topic beyond expensive JPEGs, how NFTs will tokenize real world assets. Welcome Kevin to the blockchain community event and hope you have a wonderful presentation. Thanks Bibin. As, uh, as Bibin mentioned, my name is Kevin Latinity. Um, I currently serve as the co-founder of um, Fortress Blockchain Technologies, which is really focused on financial regulatory and technology infrastructure for Web3. Our, our core mission as Bibin mentioned, is to empower other innovators to onboard the next billion people into blockchain. Um, I've been in crypto professionally since 2017, um, personally since 2015, uh, 2014, 2015, somewhere in the middle of there. It's uh, a longer time ago now than I care to admit sometimes. Time, time goes quickly. Um, before I, I was at Fortress, I, I co-founded a company called Prime Trust. Um, with Scott Purcell back in, in 2017. And Prime Trust over the years has evolved into kind of a, the infrastructure vendor for a lot of crypto, um, for a lot of exchanges, on ramps, people like that. Um, you know, at some point in time, I, I don't know the current customer list anymore very well. Um, but Prime Trust served as, as the back office and the infrastructure for Binance US, for FTX US, for um, Bitrix. Um, Kraken, I believe, was also a customer of some other crypto on ramp. So it was kind of a, an infrastructure giant in the currency space. And uh, I think one of the, the questions that I'm asked often is, is why Fortress? And why the, the transition from what is now a phenomenally successful um, blockchain fintech company into you know, building something new and building something again? And the answer is because I'm deeply passionate about Web3. And I to my core believe that it fundamentally changes the world as we know it. Um, I am beyond tired of NFTs being seen as expensive JPEGs that you can just right click save. I think that's a, that's a narrative that's been massively overplayed, but that's still, in my opinion, that's the public's perception. If you ask uh, an average person to, to explain what an NFT is, they tell you it's some JPEG on the internet that they don't understand. And my hope um, throughout kind of the next 40 minutes or so is, is that I'm able to articulate a little bit beyond the expensive JPEG use case and that we can spend some time talking about how NFTs and Web3 as a technology layer can enable actual real world innovation and not just some, I'm going to offend a bunch of people, um, but some pixelated punk or some JPEG of a monkey or something like that and, and get into real world assets. Um, now for the record, I own a very expensive JPEG monkey. So I'm also making fun of myself, which I think is okay. Um, the, I think it's important to set the context and to kind of go back to the primitives here a little bit and spend just a few minutes talking about what is a blockchain, what is an NFT, and then go into the potential of the technology. So we can all kind of level set and have the same, the same framework and the same background to operate off of. Um, you know, the blockchain at its core is just a public distributed trustless ledger. That's all it is. There's a lot of important kind of technical nuances as to how that actually operates and, and how you can keep everything in sync. But to, to the market, nothing else really matters, right? The point is it's a distributed trustless ledger that anybody can inspect the state of 
anybody can inspect the assets on it. Um, and it's something that, that can't really be modified. It, it keeps its state throughout the process and it doesn't have a, a central core kind of governing body, if you will. It's not a Google product. It's not an Apple product. It's, it's a distributed product that's, that's kind of maintained globally. And for me, where we are today with blockchain not with Bitcoin, not with cryptocurrency, but with blockchain as a whole, with this kind of distributed ledger technology is much like the internet in 1997. Or <laughs> maybe it's more like the, the internet in, in 2001, given the recent <laughs> crash of some crypto prices. Um, but still, it's, it's extremely early. And I think if you put yourself back in the late 90s, if you go back to 97 or 2001 or whatever it is, there were some applications of the internet that were extremely obvious. Things like looking up and digitizing information. Things like wikis were pretty obvious. Um, things like email was pretty obvious. Being able to communicate with one another over this open protocol globally. That made a ton of sense. But I can tell you that, that myself, and I challenge almost anybody else to, to say contrary, in 1997 wouldn't have predicted the rise of e-commerce. They wouldn't have predicted that the world's biggest store is Amazon and not you know, something that you go and you drive through. I don't think anybody would have predicted Netflix streaming 4K, 5K content to millions of households globally um, all at the same time. I would not have predicted iPhones having a glass rectangle that sits in everyone's pocket um, or Android phones or, or whatever else a smartphone is um, with 5G, the rise of social and Facebook and things like that. I think if you're sitting in 1997 and the Internet's the first thing that's coming out, those use cases just weren't obvious. And 97 was 29, 30 years ago. We're not talking about innovation on the time span of hundreds of years. We're talking about innovation in a mere few decades. I think the iPhone was launched in 2008, something around there. Um, so from 97 to 2000, that, that's a decade from kind of someone signing up for email to the iPhone being in, in millions of, of consumers' pockets. The pace here is massive. And I think if you draw this parallel back to back to blockchain, which is really the topic we're talking about, not the internet, um, to me, Bitcoin is email. It's the first obvious killer use case. We've been ledgering currency. We've been ledgering value um, really since the Medici's popularized the two-column ledger um, back in, in Florence when, when they kind of created modern banking. Um, but blockchain is the internet itself. I think we would all agree the internet is far more than just email and the blockchain is far, far more than just Bitcoin or currency um, as it is. And NFTs are a massive part of that. But unfortunately, I think NFTs have given Web3 kind of a bad name these days because everybody thinks of an NFT. They think of some pump and dump scheme. They think of some kind of get rich quick, creates this artwork, get a bunch of paid influencers to promote the artwork, the price goes through the roof, a few people make a lot of money, sell all their NFTs, and then the price comes crashing down. And, you know, us average consumers are, are left with, with massive losses. And sure, maybe that is a use case of an NFT is to create some sort of a speculative art asset. Um, but that's really not what I want to talk about. An NFT at its core isn't a security. It's not a speculative asset. Um, it's not an in-game metaverse item. Um, an NFT is just a technology layer that represents ownership and provenance. Um, if, you, if you go back, for anybody that's, that's technical in the audience, if you go back and you read EIP-721, which, you know, granted, there's different standards across different blockchains, like Solana obviously doesn't have EIPs, those are very Ethereum-driven. Um, but just kind of using Ethereum as a proxy for what an NFT is, if you go back and you read EIP-721, um, the metadata is optional in EIP-721, which is completely contrary to what people think of with NFTs as expensive JPEGs. Um, EIP-721, sure, it works for that. Um, but the core premise of the NFT is to be able to track some non-fungible asset on a distributed ledger. And now the concept of a non-fungible token that's tracked is used every day. Um, you know, private keys in, in databases, authentication tokens, these are all examples of taking a many times token um, that, is, that represents something that's non-fungible 
Um, but what we're doing in the case of Web3 is we're taking that token and we're taking it out of some sort of a walled garden. We're taking it outside of a closed ecosystem and we're putting it on a public ledger that other people can, can build on top of. And that's what starts to become really, really, really exciting. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a few different examples of how this is used in, in more of an enterprise way. And we can talk about some very specific examples and we can talk about some industries like ticketing and collectibles and even securities. Um, there's a, a special place, real estate's a special place in my heart. In 2018, I helped create uh, ERC-1400, which is a kind of open standard for tokenizing securities um, onto a blockchain. So that's, that's always a fun um, topic for me. But I think we'll, we'll start with something that's really easy to digest. And then we might get a little bit more, more complicated as we go through. Um, and we'll start with a use case that, that really has nothing visual, which I think is fun because it really flips NFTs on its head for people. Um, I was having a conversation very recently with someone who um, works in a medical device manufacturing company. So what these people do, if you've ever thought of uh, like a spinal surgery, they manufacture the metal rods, cages, screws, things like that. The doctors use during a spinal surgery to, to implant kind of into a patient's back. And this is a very US centric company. So for the international audience, um, forgive me as I hone in on some very US specific things here. Um, but there is a massive problem, at least here, um, with counterfeit medical parts. So these screws, cages, rods, things like that are manufactured to extreme conditions in extremely sanitary clean rooms with no bacteria, with a lot of precautions and a lot of professionalism goes into this. But you have a massive market, so they're very expensive because of this, of people who are manufacturing med fake medical devices basically in their garage. They're using lathes and other kind of machining equipment and they're creating rods, screws, spinal cages, things like that. And they're selling them to health organizations um, as counterfeit parts from other medical device manufacturers. And you have you know, a few massive issues, um, the largest of which is just the, the human cost. If you're going into surgery and someone's permanently putting some sort of, of a metal rod in your back, um, you want that to be manufactured as an actual medical device by a company that knows what they're doing, not some guy sitting there in a garage, right? What happens when that part fails and now it's permanently implanted in your back? You have serious injury, you have death, you have, this is a massive high stakes game. Um, not to mention the, the lower stakes things like you have insurance issues and, and other things like that. So what this company has started doing, and this is not aspirational, this is something that they are already doing today, which is a phenomenal use case of NFTs in an enterprise context is whenever they manufacture a part, they manufacture an NFT that corresponds to that part. So every screw, every rod, every cage, every device this company creates has an NFT associated with it. And because that NFT is on chain, you can verify the actual authenticity and the provenance of that NFT. And that NFT then corresponds to the physical part. When a doctor goes and puts that part in the patient's body, they then burn the NFT. So now through NFTs, what they've done is they've introduced this process by which you can verify the authenticity of the surgical item. And if there's no token that corresponds with that rod, that screw, that cage, that part is known to be counterfeit. And now you have a way of stopping it from going into a patient's body and potentially paralyzing, killing, doing a lot of, a lot of harm to that person's health. And this is something that's done today. This has nothing to do with JPEGs, nothing to do with monkeys. This is a, a very real use case of how NFTs are being used to prevent injury and in many cases to save lives. And this is happening on a massive scale today. They manufacture hundreds of thousands of these things and they're minting hundreds of thousands of these tokens. And you can extrapolate kind of a future generation where all of a sudden the medical records start to be tied to this NFT. So now you know not just that the part is genuine, but you know that the part was administered on this date by this surgeon in this hospital to this patient with these medical conditions. And you can start to build an entire kind of concept of, of a patient's life through this on something that's immutable, on something that doesn't have to be faxed from one hospital to another, taking weeks. It's on the blockchain. Anybody can introspect at any given time. Um, the authenticity is proven. The provenance is proven. You can track it through its supply chain. 
where it came from, where it was manufactured, what hospital it went to, the surgeon that put it in, all these things start to happen um, because you can put basically a private key and you can put it in a distributed database versus something that's centralized and, and only owned by one party. Um, another great example, pivoting to something more retail focused, um, a friend of mine um, owns a company called Royal. And what Royal is doing is it's allowing fans to invest in, invest, um, it's allowing fans to buy part ownership of songs and artists that they love. And I think this, this is a very interesting model because historically as a fan, you haven't been able to participate in the economic upside of a musician or of a creator. That's as fans of some famous musician, no matter what, what genre you like to consume, um, we can engage with that musician by buying um, concert tickets. We can listen to them on Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, etc. cetera. Um, if you're into those sorts of things, you can probably buy the vinyl or the CD or things of that nature if you're not a, a big streaming person. Um, but you have no way to actually participate in the economy that is music. That's an asset class that for a very, very long time has been locked to a very small group of investors, record labels, other things like that. And, and Hollywood and music is a massive business, but it's been completely inaccessible to the average retail person. What Royal has done is you can go on what is basically an NFT marketplace. I can go on Royal and I can look at different songs that they're collaborating with artists on. Um, a lot of these are kind of in the EDM space, like the Chainsmokers and other kind of famous US artists. And I can purchase an NFT that correlates to part of the royalty streams of that song. And what happens is when this song gets played on Apple Music, Spotify, a records purchase, something like that, they take all of the payouts from Apple Music, Spotify, et cetera, they tokenize it into USDC, and then they transfer it to the wallets that holds these NFTs that correspond to part ownership of the royalty streams. So the, the point again here is, is the NFT doesn't matter. Just like in the surgical devices, the value isn't the NFT. The value is proving the authenticity of that surgical device. In the case of Royal, you're not buying an NFT. The NFT to you as a consumer is irrelevant. What you're doing is you're buying real world cash flow, which is kind of cool. You're buying part of the royalties whenever this song streams. But how do you actually enable that end value to come to a user? That's where NFTs are the technology. NFTs aren't the product. NFTs aren't the user interface. NFTs are the technology layer that allows a platform like Royal to say, great, we have non-fungible positions. We have non-fungible assets that correspond to this real world cash flow. I can tokenize it into USDC, but then how do I get it to the people that own the IP rights? Um, and the answer is if the IP rights are, are represented by an NFT, then you can look at what address owns that NFT and then you can send the USDC automatically to that address. And all of a sudden this starts to work. And as we know, there's, you know, the banking industry um, is very antiquated in a lot of ways. And things like cross-border payments can be very long, time consuming, expensive, et cetera. But now all of a sudden, because this is a blockchain based stable coin, it's international by nature. And you don't have to deal with international remittance, expensive wire fees, things of that nature. So people from all over the world can participate. And for a lot of artists and a lot of what they do, um, their fan bases are global. Music is not, um, you know, kind of geography centric. Music, movies, film are inherently very global. So there's audiences and there's fan bases globally that... Um, that really need to participate in some of these things. You know, I think that's that's a couple of really interesting concrete examples um, that hopefully shift the mentality a little from you know just an expensive monkey into how this can be used in a fintech context or how this can be used in a healthcare context and in industries that actually matter, finance, health, not just arts and, and collectibles and things like that. And we can we can talk about a few industries um, as well that I think are, are really changing because of NFTs. And I think the first that we're seeing a lot of is, is ticketing. So you have a lot of NFT platforms that are looking at doing ticketing. So I think um, Autograph signed a deal um, 
with a, a large ticketing vendor that's most that's more into festivals and, and other experiences. It's a platform called Yellow Hearts um, that's really been focusing on event ticketing. Um, there's people building fan Web3 platforms around ticketing like token events. Um, and really the fundamental question is, is we've had the concept of tickets for a very long time. But why should tickets go from Web2 to Web3? What's the point? Where's the value? As an end consumer, I don't want to care about the technology. No one that's watching this on, on YouTube or, or for us on the back end here connected to Zoom, no one here had to understand TCP IP in order to, to open YouTube and watch the stream. You just went to YouTube. The same thing, you're not gonna care about how does the blockchain work? What's a seed phrase? What's a private key? What does a distributed ledger mean? What you want is you want your ticket and you wanna to go to the concert or you wanna to go to the event. You, you really don't care about the rest. So how does Web3 actually bring more value to the consumer? And ticketing is interesting because you have, it's not just one consumer. You have the, the artist, you have the musician, the celebrity, the, you know, whoever you're buying a ticket to go see, you have the venue that's holding it. Um, and then you also have the end consumer that's attending. So this is at a minimum kind of a, a three-party construct. And as you can imagine, there's a lot more parties actually in, involved. There's a lot of vendors and, and other things that support the stadiums, the venues, the artists, the technology layers, all those different things. Um, but one of the things that's really interesting about ticketing is oftentimes the end performer has no idea who came to their show, which is kind of a, a fundamental thing that we don't think about very often. So for the end performer, whether they're insanely famous or it's an indie band playing in a in a small bar um you don't know who actually came to your show what you know from like Ticketmaster or eventbrite or, or whoever these companies are what you can get is you can get the information of who purchased the ticket but many times tickets are purchased by large resellers so tickets are going in large blocks to other companies, to resellers, whether they're tech platforms or whether they're corporate brands or something like that. And they're then distributing it out to whoever's attending. But there's not a direct link between the artist and the consumer, which is weird. In a traditional B2C business, you have a very direct link between the business and the consumer that's purchasing or consuming from that business. But in the case of ticketing, you have so much middleware in the middle it actually breaks that link between the two. So artists and others have no way of actually engaging with their fans. There's no way for them to say, hey, I wanna know who came to the most concerts this year because I wanna give them a backstage pass. I wanna give them a meet and greet. I wanna send them a birthday gift and say, hey, you are you know, the number one fan in the world. Here you go, congratulations. Those things don't exist. Um, but now with NFTs, that changes things. Because you can introspect, again, the, the Ticketmaster ledger, for example, which is where Ticketmaster tickets are, are held, is in the Ticketmaster database. Um, that's not public. Ticketmaster knows who the person is, but no one else does. But if you take a ticket and you represent it by an NFT, now all of a sudden it's not in Ticketmaster's ledger, it's in a public ledger. So you as the artist or anybody else can go and introspect, and they're not going to get you know, the name, phone number, email, et cetera, um, but they're going to get the wallet address of who actually holds this ticket and you can snapshot the blockchain and you can snapshot at the time the concert starts, what are the wallet addresses that actually held these tickets, not just who bought them, but who actually came and showed up and owns the tickets. And then you can start to do all sorts of fun things around fan engagement, like I was alluding to. You can say, hey, I see that you've been to five concerts this year. Let me airdrop you to your blockchain wallet. Let me airdrop you a meet and greet. I wanna know who you are. Who is the fan that bought five different concert tickets that went from, you know, maybe they watched the concert in the US, they watched one in Europe, they even watched one in Asia. Who's toured globally following my tour? I want to have dinner with this person. How do I engage with them? All this kind of stuff can, can happen. And then you have all the financial aspects. So oftentimes scalping um, is, a, is a phenomenal drain on venues, on artists, on, on other people. You have the ability to kind of monetize the primary sale. So when the ticket is first sold, you can control that and you can ensure that the royalties are paid the right way. You know, the artist gets their cuts, the venue gets their cut, the promoters get their cut, et cetera, et cetera. But when tickets are resold, um, especially when they're 
resold for cash to friends, or you have, at least in the US, you have people standing outside venues, buying tickets, selling tickets. These are, these are known as ticket scalpers. Um, there is no royalty going back to the artist, the venue, the promoter, or anybody else on all this economic value that's created. But by taking a token and putting it on the blockchain, you can start to enforce certain things through a smart contract. And now instead of the ticket being a piece of paper with a barcode, all of a sudden the ticket becomes a programmable asset and you can start to do things like you could even restrict the ability for someone to resell a ticket. And you can say, Hey, for a, a VIP experience or something like that, you can't resell it. I've given it um, to Bibin because Bibin is my super fan and he and I have a phenomenal relationship. Um, but Bibin can't just take advantage of me and go sell it on eBay for a bunch of money to someone else. Like this is something that's curated, tailored, for Bibbin and I can lock that to them. Or even on traditional tickets, I can say, you know what? If the ticket's resold, I want 10% of that. The people that are standing at the venue buying and selling tickets all in cash, they're generating tremendous amounts of economic value. That's off of something that I've created. That's my tickets, my concert, my show. I want to get a royalty on that. And because now you've taken a piece of paper or a record in Ticketmaster's database, and you've actually turned it into an asset that you can directly program through a smart contract or, or other blockchain logic based off of what L1 or, or L2 you're using. Um, now you can actually, the tickets become programs, not just a sheet of paper. And the amount of value that you can unlock there is, is I think, absolutely um, astounding. So that's definitely an industry that, that we expect to see a lot of growth on. I think we're seeing a lot of early traction. And one of the things that's interesting that, that I, I encourage you to keep in mind as we keep talking through another four or five use cases here is these use cases will all emerge over a series of time. So just like the internet in the 90, in 97 to today happened over 30 years, 97 to iPhone was 10 years, all these use cases for Web3 aren't coming tomorrow. That's innovation doesn't happen quite at that pace. I have no idea how quickly these things start to come. But I think there's, there's different time horizons in which these use cases start to materialize. Um, Scott, um, who I've, I've worked with now for, for many years, um, you know, before Prime at Prime and now at Fortress, um, in the 90s, he was selling internet to law firms. And there were law firms in the US saying, no, I'm never going to use the internet. It's insecure. I don't trust email. We're just going to use fax machines for the rest of our lives. Um, and obviously now, after a certain time period, that's no longer the case. Web3 is going to be the same way. There's going to be a ton of people that are going to say, no, I'm never going to use the blockchain. I'm never going to tokenize assets. It doesn't make any sense. We don't need it. What we do today works fine. Um, but over some time span, call it X, maybe it's 30 years, slowly, each industry by industry is going to start to adopt the new technology. Um, that's, that's just how innovation permeates. So things like ticketing make sense today. Tickets aren't really regulated assets. You have massive value propositions to consumers and um, to artists, the venues, things like that. Um, I think things like collectibles are coming quickly. So we're seeing this happening with, with Autograph, with Air Jordan, with a bunch of other, a lot of it is sports focused, um, but I think that expands beyond sports where you've had the concept of trading cards, whether they be athletes, Pokemon, Yu-Gi-Oh, Magic the Gathering, you can tell I'm an engineer by how many trading card games I can name off the top of my head. Um, but these are things that have existed as physical assets um, for an extremely long time. Um, and, and what is the 2025, 2030 version of a physical Pokemon card? Well, the answer is the world's becoming digital. And the answer is that, that my Pikachu card and your Charizard are, are two different cards. I can't just have a token that's Pokemon that I have a million of. These cards are, are inherently different. And you could argue they're semi-fungible, which would probably be right. But the point is that they're not entirely fungible assets. So NFTs are going to be how these things are represented on a blockchain, which gets into collectibles, which gets into gaming, which gets into all these other assets. I think those things are coming quickly. And we're seeing it start with athletes, um, people buying kind of these collectibles and these trading cards from athletes that they like. But I think it's going to permeate into gaming and, and kind of fantasy worlds like the Pokemons and, and other things, especially as they go Web3 native. 
and every generation that's born is is more and more tech native i think for for me i was among kind of the last generation personally that you know didn't grow up with with a smartphone right I, my first phone was still the nokia that i played snake on um that was basically virtually indestructible that was still my first cell phone um that's obviously not the case um for everybody that's that's younger than me and every you know, every day that goes by, there's more and more people that are younger than me and fewer people that are older. So the world only shifts to more technology native. The world doesn't shift to technology adverse. Um, things like provenance are, are use cases that are happening now and today. We talked about the medical devices. Um, I saw recently, I think it was Prada announced um, a partnership with someone, I can't remember off the top of my head, but where they're going to track the authenticity of handbags through NFTs. So when you purchase a Prada bag, you're given an NFT that corresponds to that particular Prada bag that proves that this NFT or that this bag is authentic. And the authenticity of a bag can be very, very difficult to prove. There's whether it's Prada or Gucci or Louis Vuitton or any of these luxury fashion brands. Um, just walking down the street in, in New York, there's about 300 people in broad daylight that will sell you a Prada bag for $5 or for $10. You, you can guess whether or not those are real, but kind of counterfeiting is a massive issue in, in this, this high-end luxury goods market. And it can be difficult to tell. I was chatting with someone who, who works for, uh, I don't remember which fashion house it was, um, but what they're saying is one of their biggest issues, interestingly, is people will buy these um, knockoff bags and they'll then go to a store and try to return them. So they're trying to extort the cash from this high fashion house. And some of these fakes, like the ones on the street in New York for $10, anybody that, that works at Prada will look at it and say it's fake. Like, it, there's not much of a risk there. But if, if the bag costs $100 to manufacture and retails for $2,000, you have a serious economic incentive to put three or $400 into an extremely high quality fake to then try to bring it and pass it off as an authentic item and, and defraud the fashion house. What's really difficult to fake and, and virtually impossible to fake is what's the, what's the blockchain address that created an NFT. So if you pair this physical item with an NFT and a blockchain-based token, and all of a sudden you can see, is that product smart contract or not? And if it's not, then you know the NFT is not authentic and therefore the bag's not. And they're doing some cool things. The, the interesting trick there is then how do you physically pair the two? And they're doing some interesting things with embedded microchips um, within the bag itself that link to the blockchain and, and other fun stuff. I've, I encourage you to go Google it if, if that's interesting to you. But again, these are the near-term use cases. These are the things that are happening today. What happens next? I think it's, it's things like real estate. It's things like securities. I think that's kind of the next wave of the industries that, that really start to be impacted by blockchain. Um, you know, if you can take real estate ownership and you can put that asset on a blockchain and all of a sudden you can start to transfer things and you can start to close on real estate transactions in a matter of hours not days weeks etc um, i think we're going to see the advent of e-commerce for real estate um, we're seeing it slightly um, with in the u.s specifically with um Open Door has been buying homes. Redfin has been buying homes. So you can you can now sell your house to this fintech marketplace instead of selling it to another person. Um, but the settlement process is still long and expensive. As soon as you can start to put title and other ownership records on a blockchain, now all of a sudden the process is just a matter of transferring the token between you and I, which, which takes a matter of seconds. Um, and you don't have to know, do I actually own the house? You don't have to do title search, get title insurance, kind of research all the ownership records and make sure that yes i am actually the owner of the house and you can then therefore actually buy it from me because i actually own it um all those things go away because i can show you the token and the token shows back to that authenticity piece um a house is, is slightly next level from a prada bag but it's the same fundamental concept how do you prove that that you are in fact the rightful owner to something and those interestingly also get into things like estate planning, um, things like wills, things like um, legal contracts, I think are the next phase. So you know, obviously e-signatures um, have become a normal thing. 
companies like DocuSign, HelloSign, Adobe Sign. Like very rarely do I have to physically sign the documents. Everything's now e-signed. And DocuSign does this 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 great thing um, where they put this DocuSign ID next to my signature. And of course, that means it's authentic, right? It, it is impossible to Photoshop the text DocuSign ID with a few numbers and characters, right? No one actually validates that ID against anything. You just see if I print out the PDF, it has a little DocuSign thing on it and I trust it because I trust DocuSign. That isn't actually faith in the document. That's faith in the intermediary platform. Now, I think DocuSign's actually already done some partnerships in the blockchain space, which is another, which is a good kind of validation of this concept. But if you took that DocuSign ID and instead of it being an ID in DocuSign's database, now all of a sudden you mint a token for it on chain. Now anybody can externally validate that it's legitimate. Not just DocuSign can tell me it's real. Anyone can tell me it's real. So we go from a model where we're trusting DocuSign to a model that's trustless. And I can go independently verify. A law firm can go independently verify. And they're not going to go look it up manually, right? These Once the data is made public, then there's going to be all sorts of automation tools and backend frameworks and, and different um, platforms that talk to it. But the point is that you can now validate it independently versus having to trust DocuSign to do it. What happens kind of way later? For <laughs> I think that's things like health records. Um, it's the kind of insanely regulated assets, um, things that have a lot of like HIPAA regulations, things that are massively fragmented, things that are antiquated and, and slow. Before I worked in um, more pure fintech, I, I worked in healthcare fintech um, for a few years. And I can tell you the, the kind of technology systems there are beyond what you would expect antiquated. Um, it's, it's so... It's so fragmented, it's so antiquated, um, but internet has come to healthcare and so will, will Web3. Um, the concept of, of taking an asset, taking my patient records, taking my medical files. Um, you know, healthcare is already in Web3, this company that's manufacturing tokens for the surgical devices. It's not health records, um, but it's, it's already healthcare. And I think the the point that I that I really want to impart on everybody about NFTs is, is kind of back to the beginning of this that, that NFTs aren't just expensive JPEGs. If you if you go back to the fundamental technology, there are so many things that massively change when they go from a company's database to a distributed ledger that anybody can access and anyone can build on top of. We create an actual kind of creator economy, a builder's economy. It's it's blockchain, taking assets and putting them on the blockchain is, is almost the ultimate expression of open sourcing information. So there's a lot of pushes in, in the fintech space for this concept of like open finance and open banking and other things like that. The blockchain is the ultimate open finance, open banking. Um, it's the ultimate kind of settlement layer. It's the ultimate way for us to represent assets in a way that, that people can actually access them. And if, if that's the future, um, which we really believe that it is, the question is then what needs to happen for that future to exist? Um, going back to the internet in 97, if, if in 1997 I had the idea for Netflix as it is today, it would have horribly failed. I can't stream 4K movies to millions of people over a 56K router. That's not physically possible. There's infrastructure layers and, and other things that have to materialize before some of these use cases can, can happen. Imagine trying to watch YouTube on your iPhone um, on even 2G, let alone, you know, we needed 3G, 4G, 5G. Like there's just so much technological advancement in throughput and data and ability to store things. Imagine trying to do cloud-based storage when a physical server array could hold like one megabyte and that was a massive deal right now we have now we have insane amounts of storage on little tiny ssds sitting in our phones and, and other things like that there's technological improvements that have to happen some of it is, is hardware based um i think for web3 it's much less hardware based than it is software and regulatory based so a lot of and consumer education honestly so a lot of the 
expensive JPEGs and a lot of the kind of creator driven things. Um, I was, I was giving a talk last week about the same topic at a, at a conference. And the question was, you know, I, I understand that NFTs bring a lot of value through, you know, these use cases through ticketing, collectibles, provenance, like there's a lot of enterprise value in NFTs. Um, but what about all of the speculative assets, kind of creator things that are being created now? Is that something that's hurting the potential of NFTs to do this enterprise because it's giving NFTs a bad name? And my answer, which I still think is true, um, is that I don't think it does. Because one of the massive infrastructural pieces that you need is you need people to have wallets, right? Something like Amazon, something like Netflix. Um, none of those things work if you don't have internet in your house. Kind of the concept of the internet and connectivity had to permeate through the retail market before consumer technology could, could emerge, whatever that platform is. If you don't have internet, then <laughs> no tech startup is useful to you. No Facebook, no Twitter, no Instacart. Um, same exists with Web3, except Web3 is a wallet, not an internet connection. So if you can't get a wallet into everyone's house or everyone's phone, then there's no way for mass consumers to interact with the Web3 world. And a lot of the ways that people are going to get into wallets, it's not going to be because real estate is tokenized or because the spinal cage that's put into their back um, has an NFT that proves its authenticity. The way that people are going to get into a wallet is because their favorite celebrity, their favorite athlete, their favorite YouTube creator, TikTok star, Instagram model, et cetera, et cetera, um, has created a line of digital collectibles or NFTs, hopefully with some value to them. You know, hopefully it unlocks some sort of a cool experience or behind the scenes content or, you know, hopefully you're getting something for your money. It's not a purely speculative um, money grab, but that's what's going to convince you to go download a wallet is because you want to own this thing from this celebrity that you follow or this band that you love or this TikTok creator that's doing some really exclusive events or something like that. In order to get it, you have to buy this or some artist that's dropping their album as an NFT versus dropping it on Apple Music. Um, that's what's gonna get the wallets into everyone's hands. And once you have the wallet in everyone's hands, now you can start to build with the assumption that everyone can access Web3 and you can start to build some really cool stuff. So this, this infrastructure layer um, is really what we focus on uh, at Fortress. So we say kind of financial, regulatory, technology infrastructure for Web3, for blockchain, um, you know, at the core, we really work on, on three things. Um, we work on minting. So we have a bunch of different products um, across enterprise APIs to very simple um, creator-friendly UIs that you can just go sign up for and, and create tokens to actually allow tokens to be created on the blockchain. That's kind of the fundamental first piece. If you're going to tokenize an asset, you have to actually create a token. Otherwise, this doesn't really work. Um, so we, we do this at all sorts of different scale, working with you know, the, the large Fortune 500 companies all the way down to, to individual creators through the various products at, at different levels that have different feature sets and, and things like that. It's all about creating these tokens. Then we have um, the wallet business, which we have an API-based wallet for people to embed into their native applications. So when Ticketmaster gets into NFTs, Ticketmaster is not going to say, go to this third-party wallet app to get your ticket. Ticketmaster is going to say, click on the tickets tab in the Ticketmaster app. And that's going to be a wallet behind the scenes. So kind of these enterprise-grade Web3 wallets are, are a big part of Fortress's value proposition, along with a wallet app. So we also have Fortress.app, um, which is the easiest consumer wallet to use. We have a key management layer baked in, so you don't have to understand seed phrases, private keys, things like that. You don't have to understand the, the TCP IP to go on YouTube. You don't have to understand the blockchain infrastructure to open a Fortress wallet. Um, we think that's going to tremendously help in, in onboarding the, the masses um, into blockchain. And then Fortress also owns, uh, we have a fully owned subsidiary called Fortress Trust, which is a financial institution in the US that we use for custody, payment rails, compliance, all those, those sorts of things. So really our, our vision um, 
is all about assets becoming tokenized. And we spend all day, every day, building products that will power the platforms that are going to tokenize these things. The next Realtor.coms, the next Spotify's, the next Ticketmasters, um, the next Ebay's, Amazon's, et cetera. That's the infrastructure that we create to make it easy for people to, um, to go and to do that. And I think what we'll see is a lot of Web3 adoption, but it's going to be highly correlated with how many people go and build. So, you know, given kind of who the, who the sponsors are of this, obviously with, with EPAM and with the Lviv IT cluster and, and other things like that, my, my hope is that this audience is at least fairly technical in nature or, or kind of fairly developer focused. So before we open it up to, to questions kind of for the last, last eight to 10 minutes here, my, my one ask of all of you is that you guys build this future isn't going to exist. The next Amazon isn't going to exist unless someone creates it. The next Spotify isn't going to exist unless someone creates it. So to this audience that's watching, please, Web3 changes so many things, but not without all of you building on top of it. So let's, let's go do this together. Thank you so much, Kevin, for this uh, uh, enlightening talk, I would say. And when you talked about the fake bags, uh, as a sneakerhead, I always wish that my Air <laughs> Jordans had some tokens associated with it so that the money that I need to spend on my Air Jordans is well spent and I don't have to fear about fake Air Jordans coming to my home. Uh, so thank you for that. Uh, we have some interesting questions from our audience. So let me just take it one by one. Uh, Sardor asks, are you familiar with getprotocol.io and how is your business value proposition different from it? I'm honestly not familiar with them. Um, so that makes it a bit tricky for me to, to answer the second part. Um, okay. But fundamentally, our, our value proposition is to enable kind of builders of, of any background um, to build in Web3 without having to understand Web3. So you don't need to go learn Solidity. You don't need to go learn Rust. You don't need to learn how to make smart contracts. Our products are primarily API-based. And we give you a very simple Web2 JSON API that lets you create wallets, create tokens, do credit card payments, open accounts, do blockchain transactions, deploy smart contracts, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Uh, so then let's go to the next question which was with provenance or supply use cases, do you think completely public blockchains are a good fit or are we seeing more consortium private blockchains emerging for that? So what I think, and this is a very biased answer because we're announcing a big partnership next week. Um, what I think is that the, the provenance needs to be tracked somewhere publicly for the the full value to really become realized but that doesn't mean that the data needs to be public so if we use the real estate example um i would want the token that represents the ownership of my home to be on a public blockchain well, that way it's indisputable it's as distributed as possible it's fully trustless anybody can build on top of it and build validators and, and other fun and exciting things but i don't want who the owner is to be public I don't want the title to be public. I don't want the property tax records to be public. I don't want the information about the asset to be public. So we really view NFTs in this use case as the key to a filing cabinet. So the key can be public, but the contents of the filing cabinet need to be private. Okay, okay. That's, that's a clear explanation for that. Uh, regarding the, the medical use case that you were talking about, uh, we have a question from Dimitro. So he asks, uh, so basically the, the blockchain token is basically a label or a marker to the, to the item, the medical item. So isn't there a risk that this particular ID can be printed on any item and that could be copied onto a counterfeit item as well. So how do we make sure that uh, that particular item is authentic if you just copy the token ID as well, if it's just printed on the device itself? So the, I think where this comes in is, and you know, this is not um, 
this is not a use case that we've built. So I have a very high level understanding. I don't understand all the nuances of what they're doing. They may be doing more sophisticated things. But I think this is where the token burning comes into play. So you can you know, duplicate the QR code or you can duplicate the serial number, all these different things. But because the token's being burned at the time of surgery, if you create uh, an additional item with the same QR code or the same um, serial number, when you go and you look at the on-chain activity, you'll see that there's already a token that's been burned for that item. Therefore, mm -hmm. there's an issue with the item that you're holding in your hand because it's all, that item should already be used, but you're holding it in your hand. Therefore, it's obviously not in a patient. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a good explanation. Uh, the next question is, who owns the underlying asset in NFT is still a matter of concern. So in terms of real world assets, wouldn't that be a problem? It depends on, I think, how you're holding the NFT. So part of the reason that we own a financial institution is because this is a very compliance and regulatory heavy space. When we get, we talk about concert tickets or things like that, doesn't matter. But when we get into tokenizing securities, we get into real estate, we get into kind of regulated information. That really, really matters. And that's part of why a lot of what we do is we bring things like KYC and other kind of banking and, and compliance products into the NFT world. So you can start to create various tokens that can only be transferred to like KYC wallets and things of that nature. So you can still comply with all of the financial regulations. That's a great example of infrastructure that needs to exist before these things can, can be tokenized. So I think the next question is basically covering your answer, basically covers a part of the next question. So it was about, doesn't cross-border payments through blockchain involves the risk of illegal activities such as money laundering, which is a major concern. It does, but one of the things that's really nice about the blockchain versus, I don't know, I'll call it traditional money laundering, which I'm sure someone in legal will come hit me pretty soon, um, <laughs> is that the, the blockchain is, is traceable. When you're laundering funds through cash heavy businesses, when you're laundering funds through um, cross-border payments in, in cash, suitcases, other things of that nature, these items are, are both very large, but these items are really untraceable. On the blockchain, every transfer to every address is permanently there on the ledger. So you have a lot of companies like Chainalysis, TRM Labs, um, Elliptic, et cetera, et cetera, that are building some really, really cool machine learning and, and other big data technologies on top of what's essentially the world's largest state machine and the world's largest graph. And they're extracting kind of where this money is moving, who it's touching. And that's where you see so FinCEN in the U.S. maintains a wallet address blacklist of, of known money laundering activity and, and things of that nature. But I think blockchain is actually much more difficult for money laundering because it's public and it's traceable. Sure, the activity happens like it does in cash and everything else. But in cash, you yeah. can't trace it. On blockchain, it's permanently there and you can identify and stop it. So maybe this is blockchain is indeed the solution to tackle money laundering in the future. I think it is. I would argue that it is. I'm sure people would take the other perspective, um, but that's my personal view. Okay, thank you. So we have one final question, which is, can physical asset NFTs qualify as property with the same legal rights as the underlying asset? Yes. And the, the way that this works in most cases, and, and every regulatory answer should actually be, it depends, because it always depends on the underlying, you know, I, I'm not a global expert, on, on yeah. different countries' regulations across all sorts of different asset classes. But fundamentally, if you think about the NFT not as the asset, but if you think about the NFT as a technology that represents the asset, the, the NFT itself isn't the property or whatever it is. It's, it's a representation, right? So like a, yeah. a PDF isn't a security. A PDF isn't an in-game item. A PDF is not a speculative asset. A PDF is just a digital representation of whatever the content is. Maybe it's a legal contract. Maybe it's a PowerPoint presentation. Maybe it's something, but the NFT is the same way. It's just the technology layer and the asset it represents should be regulated and understood as the asset, not the NFT is the asset. Perfect. That's a, that's a great explanation. So uh, that's it uh, from the question part. Uh, thank you so much, Kevin, for this session. It was really enlightening to understand the future 
and how these blockchain use cases can be used in real life. Uh, I thank you uh, as part of EPAM, and I also wish you all the best with your next uh, uh, COP, uh, the, the partnership that you are planning to have for the next week. So all the best for that and all the best for Fortress as well uh, in achieving great success. Um, thank you so much for this session. Thanks, Bibin, and thanks, EPAM, for having me. Thank you, and have a nice evening, everyone.